This is Seven Daughters and Seven Sons, Part 2, Chapter 4. The morning was endless. I should have received petitioners, as was my duty in my father's absence. My supposed illness had excused me from the tedious task the previous three days, and I had Abdullah inform the vizier that I was still too weak to sit in a hot room for four hours, listening to an endless string of petty complaints. Tomorrow, I said. Tell the vizier I'll come tomorrow. For the later, I was sorry I had not attended to my work. It would at least have passed the time. I could not concentrate sufficiently to read to myself. I sent for a book, but the tales in it seemed boring and stupid compared to the one that I was living through. I shoved the book aside and considered sending for Amin and Uthman. Amin would have amused me with his jokes, Uthman with his utter seriousness. But they would also have talked about Nazir and the final test. I did not want to talk about it, though it was all I could think about. Finally, I walked in the garden. Fortunately, it is a very large garden. I circled it five times, engaging each gardener I encountered in a lengthy conversation on the care and habits of the plants he tended. They were all pleased. I had never evinced much interest in botany before. At last, it was time to go to the bathhouse, or nearly time. I would be early, I knew, but that was all right. I could sit on a mat in the shade of the palm tree that grew in the courtyard and wait for Nazir there. But no sooner had I entered the building than the attendant noticed me. He hurried forward and bowed low. Malana al-Amir, he said, I have a message for you. A message? I felt my bones turn to milk. Nazir had sent an excuse. The excuse meant my suspicions were true. But in a flash, I realized that knowing would leave me worse off than before. Could I confront him, calling him a liar? No, I, I would simply be forced to end our friendship because I had made such an issue of his appearance at the bath. I had said that if he did not come, he was no friend of mine. Had Amin, when he suggested the plan, seen all the way to this inevitable outcome? And how was it that I, Mahmud, son of the Wali of Tira, had not? What's the message? I asked, keeping my voice calm. But my fists were clenched, my nails digging into my palms. Your friend Nazir came by, oh, I guess it was, well, mid-morning. Yes, I think that's right. Mid-morning. He said to tell you this, these very words. The old man paused portentously. Yes, I urged impatiently. The words? The very words? Let me see. The old man scratched his head. My memory isn't what it used to be. But still, it isn't bad for a man my age. These were his words, his very words. He said them in a loud, reverberating voice, as if he were reading a proclamation in a public square. I came for a purpose, and I left for a reason. The old man smiled and nodded his head quickly several times, obviously pleased with himself. That's all? I asked. That's all he said? Well, he said more. Of course he said more. He said, peace be with you, grandfather. And he said, do you know Prince Mahmud? A foolish question, I told him. Who in Tira doesn't know Prince Mahmud? And then he said, the prince will come here about noon. I want you to give him a message. He repeated the message half a dozen times, and he made me repeat it too. He gave me a whole dinar. 
The old man pulled the coin from the pocket of his trousers and rubbed it gleefully. It was probably the most money he had ever held in his hand at one time in his life. I came for a purpose, and I left for a reason, he repeated. That's all. I came for a purpose, and I left for a reason. By my father's head, I cried, I am a fool. I am the worst fool to ever walk the earth. I turned as if to leave, but the old man put his hand on my shoulder. I faced him again. Your friend said to give you this, he said, and into my hand he put a chess piece, a white queen. If I had not been sure before, I was sure now. With a cry like a wounded lion's, I rushed out of the bathhouse as fast as my feet could carry me. Ferris ran after me. He had to run fast to keep up with me, and he was really too old for such activity. By the time we reached the quay, he was flushed and breathless. His usual dignity dissolved in perspiration. But I had no time to worry about Ferris. It took me only a few minutes to find the harbor master. He was standing at the end of one of the docks, directing the unloading of a ship carrying linen and rice from Egypt. He saw me running toward him and shook his head, amazed. Prince Mahmud, he cried when I stood next to him. What's the matter? You look like a wild man. What's happened, Malana? Several ships lay at anchor in the harbor. With a wave of my hand, I took them all in. Did you see a woman board any of these ships in the last hour or so? I asked. She was probably carrying a good deal of luggage. The harbor master nodded. I saw such a woman, he said, but she's not aboard any of the ships that's still at anchor. He pointed out to sea. My eyes followed his finger, and far off, beyond the breakwater, against the horizon, I could make out a sail. She boarded that ship, my lord, the harbor master explained. About an hour ago, she came down and boarded the Al Fustat. It was ready to sail, waiting only for her. It set off immediately, and the breeze is so stiff it's made very good progress. Who was she? I begged desperately. Who was that woman? My lord, it seems you would know that better than I, he replied calmly. I don't know who she was. I never saw her before in my life, at least not so far as I know. She was heavily veiled. I struck the side of my head with my hand three times. Fool, I sputtered. Fool. Fool. The harbor master stiffened. Who's a fool, my lord? He asked sharply. Me, I assured him. Only me. Where is that ship going? The one upon which the woman set sail. To Alexandria, my lord, the harbor master replied. Then I must go to Alexandria too. Which of these other ships sails for Alexandria? The harbor master shook his head. None, my lord, he said. We don't expect another ship to sail for Alexandria within the week. The one we are unloading just came back from there, and the Al Fustat just set out. But I must go to Alexandria, I insisted. We'll make one of my father's dows ready to sail. How quickly can that be done? Three days at the very least, Malana. The harbor master replied. He stared at me, frank curiosity in his eyes. He must have thought I had lost my mind. Well, in a way, I had. It'll cost money. Ferris will get you what you need. If you can have the ship ready to sail in less than three days, there will be ten dinars in it for you. I turned toward Ferris. Stay here and assist him. I ordered. But, my lord, 
Ferris, the perfect servant, dared to protest. I don't think I should leave you. I'm all right, I assured him. Truly, I am. And I'll tell you exactly where I'm going. You can come for me there later. I'm going to the gaming house. Amin and Uthman will be there. They'll look after me. Mollified, he bowed his assent. I left the harbor and pushed my way through the streets with slow, heavy steps. There was, it seemed, a mountain on my back. Amin and Uthman were waiting for me. They realized instantly the significance of the fact that Nazir was not with me. Amin started talking even before I sat down. He didn't come. He made some excuse. I nodded briefly. Well, now you know. I mean, sighed and smiled at the same time. Now you are satisfied. Your suspicions were correct. You can forget Nazir. He doesn't exist. We can go back now to the way it was. We can go back to just the three of us. What are you talking about, I mean? I shook my head slowly. I could not believe what my ears were hearing. You don't understand. I thought you did, even if you didn't like it. But you understand least of all. Amin stared at me, blankly. Listen to me, Amin, I said slowly. Listen to me very carefully. Nothing is the same. Nothing will ever be the same again. There lives on this earth a woman who can be my friend and my lover. Do you understand that? Do you understand what a marvelous thing that is? A friend is a friend, Uthman interrupted, and a woman is a woman. You can't have them in one person. The whole world knows that. If that's what the whole world knows, I announced emphatically, then the whole world is wrong. I believed the whole world and I lost her. I didn't trust my own instincts and now she's gone. She's left Tira. You're well rid of her, Amin insisted. It was as if he had not heard a single word I had said. She is a freak, but she's a woman too. And like all women, she's a deceiver. Who knows what reason she had for her pretense, I retorted. Who knows what poverty or what threat drove her to do what she did. And now, by leaving this white queen behind, she reveals all. But for my deceit, there was no reason. No reason whatsoever. I moved my fingers over the carved surface of the chess piece I held in my hand. I had only to confront her honestly with what my body, my heart, and my soul told me to be true. If I'd trusted myself, she'd be my affianced bride at this very moment. Instead, she's off to Alexandria, and I can't follow for three days. In my despair, I covered my face with my hands. Follow her? Uthman sounded like an idiot. Follow her? You can't leave, Tira. Amin said, you are the prince. Your father will never permit it. I lifted my face from my hands and looked directly at Amin. A merchant prince, my friend, I reminded him. In our family, the heir always makes a journey so that he can understand the sources of our wealth. I have delayed mine because my father needs my help here at home. But he knows as well as I do that I must go. I delay no longer. I don't care if I have to scour every city from here to the Western Ocean. I don't care if I come back with a white beard down to my feet. If she lives, I'll find her and make her my princess. You're in love, my lord, Amin sneered. Take a cold bath and it will pass. I stood up and grabbed Amin. I pulled him up next to me and put my face very close to his. You know nothing, I told him. 
You are an ignoramus. Haven't you the imagination to think what it will be like to love such a woman? At that moment, our two bodies and our two souls will become one. I would travel to the ends of the earth. I would die, my friend, in search of such a consummation. I pushed him down again into his seat and turned away from both of them. But I was not halfway across the room when Uthman was at my side. Please, my lord, he said, let me come with you. You shouldn't make such a journey alone. I smiled a little. I won't be alone, my friend. Ferris will come with me, and a whole ship full of sailors. You must stay here. Your father needs you. God alone knows how long I'll be gone. But I will never forget that you offered. I embraced him quickly. Then I walked back to the table. I held out my hand. I mean, stared at it. Take it, I said. We've been friends for a long time. Eventually, we'll be able to forgive each other. He stood up, took my hand, and clasped it tight. Goodbye, Mahmoud, he said. I'm sorry. Goodbye, Amin, I replied. I pray that some day you too will find what I go to seek. Amin shook his head. What I was looking for, he would never seek. But I left with my head high and my heart singing. My confusion and my melancholy were gone. I knew what I wanted, and I knew what I had to do to find it. The end of part two.